Okay, hi there. Welcome to a micro video. Uh, in lessons today, we were thinking as a group about the strategies that businesses often use if they're trying to increase their revenue. So here are a few thoughts and examples that hopefully might be useful for you uh, from our discussion in, in our lessons in our economics set this afternoon. A couple of points I made to the class to start with, that in some industries and markets, it's quite interesting, the revenues flow into a business are highly cyclical. In other words, there's quite a, a close correlation between the economic cycle and the growth of their revenues. Uh, this links to the concept known as income elasticity of demand. If you have a luxury product, for example, that's great news when incomes are rising. Consumers are buying more of those products and sales growth and revenue growth will be pretty strong. Equally, in a downturn, the danger is that you lose a lot of sales as people cut back on their luxury products. Uh, for some goods and services, for some products, demand is actually counter-cyclical. Uh, sales may go up during a recession and a downturn, and that's often the case with inferior goods. Whereas other products have a much lower income elasticity and their, rev their sales and thereby the revenues are not susceptible too much to the cycle. However, other businesses might be exposed, as we've seen in recent months, to unexpected, often quite sizable external shocks. If you're an airline, for example, the global pandemic has hit clearly the amount of travel across borders. The same is true if you're a business relying heavily on hospitality and tourism, as the public health crisis has engulfed millions. If you're looking to increase revenue, what I was suggesting to my students is there are essentially two main approaches to grow your revenue, to grow the top line of a business. The first is simply to sell more stuff, to increase the quantity or the amount or the volume that you sell over time. And we'll look at some strategies for that in a second. The, the other approach is to achieve a, a higher selling price per unit to lift the average revenue uh, from each block of goods or services sold. So when we think about increasing the volume of sales, lots of options, here are a few. One is to think about entering new markets with your existing products. So for example, targeting overseas markets instead of just the domestic consumers. Well, you know, lots of good examples of businesses that have come into the UK. Um, to try and increase their sales, having, in a sense, perhaps uh, matured their sales in their home country. The second approach is to try to broaden the product range to widen what's called the revenue base. The, the more products you have in danger of sale, potentially the greater the volumes and obviously the, hopefully the total revenues will rise as a result. In terms of existing products, firms often what they often do is when products have reached the, the maturity or the decline stage of uh, sales, they try to extend the product life cycle by uh, you know small scale iterations and innovations. If you think about Cadbury's dairy milk and all the various types of chocolate you can now buy as Cadbury's try to extend the product life cycle. Getting that sweet spot is right, isn't it? Having new products launching just as the old products uh, whose sales are tailing away. A lot of firms also engage in price discrimination strategies. We'll go through some examples there in a second. It's six years since, well, five, six years since Apple unveiled in a great ceremony their first smartwatch. And as you can see, the Apple smartwatch, or the Apple Watch, has grown into a pretty significant disruptive force in the wearables market. Uh, look at the look at the the, the sales uh, in 2018 2019. Apple's sales went up from 22 and a half million to over 30 million. Indeed, now Apple sells more smartwatches than the entire Swiss Swiss watch industry. Not easy to say. Here's a great example of how scale, volume of sales must grow your revenues, and of course, critically, uh, the Apple Watch is not cheap. So you're selling a lot more, millions of units at a, at a pretty hefty price per unit. Our own little business, due to you, obviously we have our revision conferences, our student to live events, always looking to try and grow the product range to widen the revenue base. Here's some new politics flashcards. We've just set up an online catch-up on demand 
in politics and sociology and psychology and economics and business and other subjects. So you're looking to grow, widen the revenue base uh, from which sales can expand. Uh, from an economics point of view, uh, a really key exam point is to emphasise always in an answer the importance of the coefficient of elasticity of demand <clears throat> when a firm is setting prices. A uh, bit of revision from theme one, Micro, but you should know that the elasticity of demand does actually vary along a straight line demand curve. Uh, you see when prices are high, let's say, for example, we cut the price from P1 to P2, and our quantity goes up from Q1 to Q2. Can you see there that uh, the fall in the price has actually caused total spending and hence total revenue to go up? We've lost the blue area because you're selling at a lower price per unit. But we've gained the, the yellow area in terms of selling more quantity. And if that's the case, a fall in price uh, will increase revenue when demand is price elastic. However, if we cut the price from P3 to P4, we're now getting a very low price per unit Yes, we're selling a little bit more, Q3 to Q4, but you can see the blue area of lost revenue is much bigger than the area of gain. In this case, the fall in price from P3 to P4 actually causes total spending and revenue to go down because demand is price inelastic towards the bottom of a straight line demand curve. So in this situation, the firm is probably best suited to cutting price if they want to increase revenue. Uh, you can see the gain in quantity far outweighs the loss in price per unit. In this situation, however, the firm will be better off increasing price on the right-hand side since demand is inelastic, the coefficient is less than one, and uh, the revenue gain would be, uh, well, hopefully fairly obvious there. A lot of firms, as I would say, use price discrimination. Now, there are loads of separate videos uh, on the Cheetah Jew YouTube channel about price discrimination. Just very quickly, different degrees of discrimination, uh, in some cases, firms are willing to auction their products and get from consumers what they're willing to pay. It's called first degree. The second degree is where you, where the price you charge varies by quantity sold. So you might uh, boost your revenue, for example, by selling uh, group tickets, family tickets, uh, bulk purchase discounts, etc. It's a way of lifting the total revenue by dint of the quantity you're selling. Often time, you might increase your revenue by charging more at a higher a higher price at a peak time compared to a price at an off-peak time. Either way, both of them are a way of tapping into different demand to grow your revenue. And the most common form of price discrimination is third degree. That's where you charge different prices for the same product to different groups of consumers. And you segment the market, you break up the market according to the coefficient of elasticity of demand or according to differences in income age, sex, or some other some other metric. And of course, you, you tend to charge a higher price to consumers with an inelastic demand and uh, a lower price for consumers who are price sensitive. There is a very strong link <clears throat> between price discrimination and businesses looking to grow their revenues and potentially their profits. So I do urge you to have a look at our videos on price discrimination for more technical detail. And there's loads of examples in markets, from haggling in markets to phone tariffs, surge pricing in taxi companies. Cinemas, of course, geniuses at trying to price discriminate. So too hairdressers. So the first way of growing your revenue is essentially to be, to be using pricing uh, to grow your volumes, to increase the quantity that you sell. I said there were two main channels of increasing revenue. The second is really to go slightly in a different direction and just look, aim to sell at a higher price per unit. It's called the average revenue, the price per unit. So some companies deliberately pitch their products, their goods and services as premium products for which they can charge a premium price. And that may be linked to the quality of the good or service on offer. Other companies, businesses target sales in countries where customers have a higher per capita income, where living standards are higher. And again, that means you can charge higher prices. Some firms, you may know these examples, they deliberately limit the supply of the product. So they're limiting the quantity to create artificial scarcity. And scarcity of supply allows them 
to uh, charge a higher price, particularly if there's a kind of secondary market where people can, can resell. Um, bundling is a good example. Uh, we'll come to an example in a second, but bundling is where you put together three or four items that might have been sold separately, but you bundle them, bundle them together in a smart way, uh, and as a result, you therefore um, um, are able to get a higher value from what you're selling. So examples uh, would be the artificial scarcity. Great examples would be something like Supreme and Palace, um, you know, where they deliberately limit what's available. They have a drop and uh, people know there's only a limited number of new T-shirts or shoes, or whatever it is, accessories. Of course, that creates artificial scarcity, which people are willing to pay a premium price for. Some brands don't really use discounts. You know, it's very rare, for example, that you get a discount from Apple or a discount from Whole Foods compared to the deep discounters like Aldi and Little and the other major supermarkets. And this is a deliberate strategy. They're keeping the price high because they know if they do offer discounts, then people will come to expect discounted prices and that makes it harder to grow your revenues in the future. Uh, it's really interesting to think about businesses such as maybe Pizza Express, which have really struggled, if truth be told, for, for several years, even before the pandemic. And I think one of the mistakes that Pizza Express might have made was to try and start selling their margaritas and their dough balls in supermarkets. And often these pizzas are actually heavily discounted. You might be able to buy two for two for five pounds or two pizzas for six pounds. I'm sure you've seen those special offers. And actually, although you're selling more pizza, that actually might be cannibalizing sales in your restaurants. Because once people have bought a very cheap, decent pizza from, from the supermarket, from Pizza Express, they might not necessarily be more likely to go to the restaurant and pay four times the price for the same pizza. So the danger is, not necessarily happen with this business, the risk is that uh, price discounts can actually devalue the brand in the long term. Uh, a product bundle is really interesting. A product bundle is basically you put together a combination of goods and services sold to consumers in a single package. And typically the products in a bundle are complementary to each other. And I think, you know, Domino's, their app is just a great way of this. You, know, you add items to your order. They're very good at uh, nudging you to add in the garlic bread or the, the discounted Coke, you know, the, Bundling is a way of basically bringing products together into a single price. And uh, as a result, the average order placed goes up. So there we go. This has been a look at some of the things we've been, we've been discussing in lessons today. Uh, loads of examples of some of the strategies that businesses might use if they want to increase their revenue.